Uh, Good evening. So we've all gathered here together tonight, sharing the same wish to be freed of all suffering, pain and misery, and rather to experience happiness. Not the transient happiness we, we uh, um, sometimes encounter, but a lasting, stable happiness, a lasting peace of mind. And it's this wish to overcome problems and experience lasting happiness that turns us to apply ourselves to cultivate uh, Buddha Dharma within us. And the meaning of practicing Buddhism is to transform our mind, because it is through transforming our mind that we eliminate suffering and its causes and experience lasting stable happiness. This term suffering, it needs when one hears it, one needs to understand that there are many layers of subtlety to suffering. So the, uh, the Buddha, he presented, uh, divided suffering in different ways. The most common is the threefold division. So this starts with the coarsest forms of suffering, that which we're most familiar with, the suffering of physical and mental pain. Then there is a subtler level, the suffering of transient happy, happiness, and the subtlest level, all pervasive suffering. <laughs> And for those for whom a list of three is a little long, it can be condensed into two, physical suffering and mental suffering. All suffering that we experience, from coarse levels to a, a mere discontent, this entire range comes about in dependence on causes. It's imperative then to understand the causes, to understand the sequence that leads to suffering. From the ripening of karma, we take repeated, uncontrolled rebirth within the suffering realms of samsara. And it's through attaining this, this basis of physical and mental aggregates, our body and mind, that we experience suffering. And that, that this physical and mental basis, our body and mind, is the third type of suffering, all-pervasive suffering. The basis upon which we experience all forms of suffering, both the suffering of physical and mental pain, and the suffering of trans transient pleasure. So the, our, con our contaminated aggregates come about in dependence on the ripening of contaminated karma, and that karma is contaminated because it was accumulated due, uh, due to the afflictions. So there's a sequence of events. In dependence on afflictions, karma is accumulated. In dependence on karma, 
uncontrolled rebirth with this basis for suffering, these physical and mental aggregates are attained and we thereby experience suffering. In the sequence then, having, it, it comes down to having this body and mind, which comes about in dependence on the cause, namely con, uh, karma, and that karma was accumulated in dependence on causes, our various afflicted minds, such as anger and attachment and jealousy, and all of these afflictions come about in dependence on a cause too. And that is the very root cause of all our suffering, the ignorance of self-grasping. Dingle Tarbainna, what I've presented thus far is a summation of what we looked at last week. Last week when we looked at the 87th verse, please bless me to develop an intense longing for freedom from this great ocean of boundless, vicious existence, violently tossed by waves of affliction and karma, infested by sea monsters of the three sufferings. So here, it's been expressed for, uh, very poetically what I have just presented. The three sufferings are how we experience suffering, and this suffering has come about in dependence on waves of affliction and karma. So here this refers to, uh, is, is presented as this great ocean of suffering infested by sea monsters of the afflictions. And this is what causes us, causes us not only our pain, but these afflictions are what bind us to the wheel of, of cyclic existence. It's our afflictions that keep the wheel of cyclic existence turning and keep us bound to this wheel of suffering. And this, what we presented last week and what I've uh, summarized here tonight then, is what one needs to reflect on again and again, seeing how we are bound in suffering, giving rise to a sense of disenchantment for samsara so as to give rise to an, uh, an overriding, burning desire for freedom, for liberation. And freedom and liberation, these terms refer specifically to freedom from suffering, and suffering refers to the afflictions. So in one, from the Buddhist perspective, freedom is freedom from our afflicted minds, or liberation is freedom from our afflicted minds. Because in that way, when one has such a freedom, one is free from suffering and abides in a state of lasting, stable mental peace, a state of lasting happiness. <laughs> Sajidele <laughs> 
Tarpa Last week also gave the illustration that if someone is living somewhere and they've come to recognize that actually where they live is quite difficult. Up to this point, it's all they had known and they just thought this is how the world existed. But they've come to hear about somewhere else that unlike where they live, the water is not polluted. The air is not polluted and, and, and food is plentiful and nutritious. And not only that, there's marvels such as electricity and excellent transport. So in other words, what they had considered normal, they've come to realize is actually quite poor compared to somewhere else. We're recognizing what is possible. That person will give rise to a strong wish to leave where they are and rather go and live somewhere free of such problems and difficulties. So that is likened to someone who's reflected well on the nature of samsara and come to realize how samsara is pervaded by suffering. That there is no state that is bound within samsara where one experiences freedom from suffering. Therefore, not only does one experience unwanted, um, uh, unwanted uh, circumstance following unwanted circumstance, but one in samsara is always in danger of falling into a situation even worse than one has experienced thus far. Recognizing this and recognizing also that there is a state of freedom, a state beyond suffering, beyond sorrow, gives rise to the determination to seek such a place and thereby having come to recognize the causes of our suffering, the afflicted minds, a determination arises to gain liberation from the afflictions, liberation from suffering, because they will have recognized that it's these afflictions that cause all our physical pain as well as our mental pain. And therefore, the true enemy to be destroyed are these afflicted minds on our continuum, minds like anger, jealousy, pride, and so forth. Such a person who's given rise to determination for freedom will strive to receive teachings and reflect on them and will take great joy in doing so, knowing that this goal of lasting, stable mental peace is attainable and is approaching through their endeavors. Now we're going to come to the next verse, the 88th verse. So this is still within the same presentation, but this now focuses on the method to train one's mind in order to attain liberation. The 88th verse. Please bless me to overcome the view which sees this unbearable prison of samsara as a ple pleasant garden and thereby grasp the banner of liberation, upholding it with the three trainings and the treasure of Arya jewels. 
Then so you got to know you call what he said, then on the call was said is chigore, call was said, chigure, call what near the banner, so you got what is, so you got a so you got what is, and the cousin kissing Yamashi, Dunga, so Dunga, Dunga, so you got a hobo, Dunga, Chicana, and Yongo, the Ganga Shure, Ganga, so you got a shure, as such, some more. First line of Tibetan is, is our second line. And this term unbearable, this refers to the mirrored sufferings, all sufferings from, from coarse to subtle that we experience in samsara. Reflecting well, we come to recognize this unbearable condition we find ourselves in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tidak Chipotomebakidi Understanding why being bound within samsara is unbearable comes about in dependence on the reflections in the preceding verse. And recognizing that as long as one is bound within samsara, one experiences experiences suffering experience, unwanted suffering experience upon unwanted suffering experience. That there is never a moment of respite in that there's never a time of actual peace. There's always the danger of things getting worse. There's always the danger that when we're suffering, further suffering that will befall us. And certainly when we, we're experiencing uh, pleasures in samsara, those will end, and they will end, and further suffering experiences will come. This is certain. This is a key point to have reflected on, because in this way one comes to recognize that the situation that we are bound in is a situation that no one would willingly choose, especially when freedom is, is possible. And it's this recognition that leads us to understand that our situation in samsara is unbearable, especially when taking into account the situation in the lower realms. And whilst we have a, a rebirth in the happy migrations, and it's caused, called so because in relation to the experiences of animals, and certainly of spirits and beings in the hells, it is a happy migration. But when our life ends, depending on the karma on our continuum, rebirth in such a suffering realm is always possible. And certainly, looking at the lower realms can be difficult, especially the unseen realms, but just looking at situations for humans, how the situation in some countries was peace, peaceful and, and prosperous, and then things changed. An environmental catastrophe warfare, or for individuals within a community, whether here or elsewhere, where an individual situation has changed. Perhaps a relationship they were in turned violent, conflicts arose in their life, and accidents occurred. 
anything like this and we see how our situation in samsara is so unstable and we are surrounded by illustrations of where the suffering is intense. And many societies, unlike like ours, uh, views of, of, of types of discrimination are considered acceptable. Dishonesty is considered, is, is normalized. So just looking at the world around us, as well as our own experiences, as well as those within um, our societies, we come to see how unwanted experiences, suffering, pain and misery, abound. For, and there is no freedom for any being as long as they remain within samsara. The sufferings in the low realms, the animals, the spirits and the hell beings, so much more intense and long-lasting than what we have to experience. If we were, though, to compare ourselves to the, uh, um, the, the situation of beings in the other high realms, those of, of, in the God realms, certainly their, their pleasures are far greater than anything than, than any human can experience. And amongst the three types of suffering, they experience no physical and mental pain, for example. But even where they are in a far better state than we are, in terms of experiences of happiness, they are not liberated from samsara, which means they are not liberated from uncontrolled rebirth. Death will come. And death in a lower realm will eventually follow. So this needs to be reflected on well, so as to give rise to the clear determination that there is only one rebirth worth striving for, and that is the rebirth that follow from having eradicated our afflictions together with their seeds. Because such a state is the state of liberation where the afflictions, because their seeds have been eradicated, the afflictions can never ripen. And in this way, one is liberated from the sufferings of samsara, from samsara itself. One is no longer bound to this wheel of suffering. One is liberated. One is free. And such a being any rebirth they take will not be uncontrolled, and it will be a rebirth that is freed of all three types of suffering. Hence, they are liberated. They are free from all forms of suffering. Chesan 
ก็มาตัวคอวาเลยอ่ะคอวากิญโมปะจิเกเกดิเมบะซุยผุทาร์ปะตะมาทอปะอินนะกิดีนะคอวาเดนะกอราเกปชิดิโกเรกอกอราเ
Chang This, seeing the prison of samsara as a pleasant garden, this then shows how we have a tendency to focus on the pleasures of samsara. To some extent, we are aware of the faults, but we focus on the pleasures. If we watch our mental state, certainly there's an aversion to suffering, but this is accompanied by a desire for pleasures of samsara. And this really f- refers primarily to the objects of the sense pleasures, things that we see and that we find pleasant, things that we hear and find pleasant, we taste and find pleasant, smell and touch, these five that we find pleasant. And those objects we desire. We don't see them in a, in a, in a balanced way. We see their attainment and experience of them, as an achievement of a happiness that is worth striving for. And not only that worth striving for, when attained and experienced, we feel satisfied. We've achieved something worthwhile. And this way of thinking is clearly contrary to what has been presented before about an unbearable prison of samsara. Being blind to this prison that we are actually bound in, we experience it as quite pleasant, as okay. And then um, we have a mental fo- a focus on achieving sense pleasures and being satisfied with them. And our thoughts, our mental process, our thoughts are consumed with what the pleasures we have achieved and wanting them again and thinking how to get them. In this way, we live our
position we find ourselves in is that we overvalue the pleasures of the senses. We underappreciate the faults associated with those same pleasures. The way we view them is out of balance, it's not in accordance with reality. Going along with this, or accompanying this, the pleasures of liberation are something we haven't yet seen for ourselves. We, of course, never experience liberation because when one is liberated, one attains lasting happiness. So we've never experienced it, and we haven't yet seen or realized the pleasures of, of liberation, understood them in a deep and transformative manner. So when we think about this, the, the great obstacle we face right now is that we do still see samsara as being okay, as being pleasant, like a pleasant garden. And we still see the pleasures, or the benefits rather, of liberation, those we only relate to as theoretical. We haven't yet come to experience them in terms of an actual realization that this, of what they are and achievable. Hence the position we're in is quite pitiful. We remain blind to our potential and deceived by our limitations. And it's for this reason that we remain deceived and we continue to deceive ourselves. Hence, this verse, follow, or the meditations of this verse, follow the meditations of the preceding verse, where the emphasis was on the faults of samsara, this great ocean infested by sea monsters. Reflections on the faults of samsara, as well as the benefits of liberation, so as to come to a more balanced view, overcome this faulty way, this unbalanced way of relating to samsara, and rather give rise to a burning desire for freedom from this prison. And in it, that I'm not going to get a ticket. You know, 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 Dulo, That's what's presented here in general, in other circumstances in life we can see. Not seeing the faults of something, one continues to engage in it. Blind to the faults that keep following. We keep experiencing unwanted example, uh, unwanted situations because we keep engaging in the same behavior. But even on a, a more basic and fundamental level, seeing samsara as pleasant, seeing the attainment of pleasures that are themselves within samsara as the, a goal worth striving for, we engage in all our activities, our physical work, our verbal communication, in work and outside of work, everything we do is motivated to achieve pleasures within samsara. To have nice clothing, to have delicious food, to have a, an impressive home, to have a good time with our friends and so forth. And all our physical and mental energy goes into accomplishing this and this alone. And in particular, where what we value is primarily the attainment of, of pleasures of the senses, this can have a profound impact on ethics. It leads, leads people 
to lie, to deceive, to take advantage of others. It leads people to take decisions that benefit themselves or their group and harm others. The most obvious is warfare. Another is environmental destruction. Wanting pleasures for oneself or one's group first and foremost is what leads to all the harm in the world. Whether it's conflict or lying, deceiving others, it all comes from wanting pleasures for oneself and one's group. Pleasures which are bound within samsara and have no lasting value at all. Do There's no end to these desires, wanting ever more of, 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 of the sense pleasures. We really struggle to be content with just the minimum of what is required. You just need to look at, at people's wardrobes to see an array of clothing that can all be explained or justified in many ways. These are required for particular occasions, for example, for work, for lounging about the house, for out with my friends, or if I'm out with my friends somewhere uh, more formal, or if I go somewhere particularly for formal. And for my varying sporties, various sporting activities, I also need these different items of clothing. And in this way, we have a large wardrobe. And then we see something new, a new color, a new design, I have no need for it, but it's, it, it brings pleasure to the mind, and that pleasure we see as being something worthwhile striving to achieve, and we buy another one. And this is just the illustration of clothing. You can certainly look at people's homes, or um, relationship to uh, technology, electronic goods, or their motor car, to all kinds of set, uh, set pleasures of the senses. And even at find a, a, a subtle level of ensuring you have the right brand, it's bought from the right kind of shop, and in this way you replace things which are per perfectly suitable just so as to achieve some temporary pleasure, for example, impressing one's friends. And not only do we um, spend so much of our mental energy on desiring and seeking out such pleasures, but if necessary, we'll take advantage of others so as to get them. We'll lie to others, steal to others. And this is all because we see the pleasures of the senses as being a worthy end in themselves to strive for, for happiness. <laughs> Tungi 
Chizana what you be encouraged to do with what's presented in this verse, as well as the preceding and verses that will follow, is to rebalance through cultivating wisdom one's mental focus. We to go to from one extreme of being uh, delighting in the pleasures of samsara to another extreme of being focused on liberation to the extent that it brings harm to, to oneself, this would be foolish. What one's trying to do is develop wisdom and thereby one will have a more balanced way of relating to the world in which we find ourselves. So a person who has developed a genuine striving for a yearning for liberation from the afflictions, they will eat healthy food. They will live somewhere that's conducive to receiving teachings and reflecting on those teachings. They'll wear warm clothing when it's, when it's cold, and they'll wear lighter clothing when it's hot. Because in order to uh, fulfill their, determ their determined aspiration of uh, achieving liberation, they need a healthy body. They need comfortable material circumstances. So therefore, it's not about renunciation in the way that this word is usually used, but it's about developing wisdom and thereby a balanced approach to how we live our life, and in particular, what we value and therefore what we prioritize. As one gives rise to desire for liberation from suffering, it, one will, through this changing of values, before what attracted one and one found pleasurable, will now seem superficial. Something that, for example, we gave up many things when we were young, as we go, go, grew older, so too we'll see those pleasures as superficial, as not having lasting value, and we'll easily let go of them. In this way, we'll have ever more time and mental energy to focus on transforming our mind with understanding that it's through transforming our mind and eradicating the afflictions and their seeds that we will bring an end to our suffering. We will attain actual freedom. <laughs> Just <laughs> 
Reflecting well like this one will give rise to a wish for liberation. And then one needs to apply oneself to the method. So what is the method to achieve liberation from suffering? So by this point of the meditation, one will be very clear on the chain of, 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 of causes that lead to suffering. We experience suffering as the result of ripening karma. So there's the result is suffering. Its cause is karma that we've accumulated. Karma itself, whilst it's a cause of suffering, it itself is a result resulting from its cause of the afflictions. The afflictions, whilst the cause of karma are also a result, they come from their root cause, the ignorance of self-grasping. So this sequence will be vividly clear to us. We will have understood that by eradicating the ignorance of self-grasping, the root cause of this entire sequence that keeps us bound and enchained within the prison of, of samsara, by eradicating this root cause, we will attain freedom. And how to do so? It's through cultivating the contrary mind. Contrary mind, contrary mind to ignorance is one of wisdom. And the ignorant, contrary mind to the ignorance of self-grasping in particular is the wisdom realizing emptiness. In particular, where the wisdom realizing emptiness is that wisdom is conjoined with the union of calm abiding and meditative insight. And in this, that I am not just going to sing or anything. My love, some people are not going to sing. They said, "Love, some people are not going to sing." They said, "Just that, my love, that was said to me. I am not going to sing. Love, I am not going to sing. Yes, and the people are not going to sing. They are not going to sing." And then the verse presents the method, how to achieve liberation. So for us, it's in the fourth line. In the bracket, you would say, in order to achieve liberation from suffering, you need to train in the three trainings and the treasure treasure of Arya jewels. So this is the method, the three trainings and the treasure of Arya jewels. The three trainings refers to training in ethical restraint, training in concentration, and training in wisdom. Jesus, Tingins three trainings. Again, the training ethical restraint, concentration and wisdom. So these are just referred to when we always recognize that the root cause of our suffering is the ignorance of self-grasping and it is eradicated through cultivating its antidote, the wisdom realizing emptiness, in particular where it's conjoined with the union of calm abiding and meditative insight. The wisdom realizing emptiness is what is meant by the higher training in wisdom. And for it to be profoundly effective, it needs to be conjoined with calm abiding and meditative insight. And that refers to the second higher training, the higher training in concentration. The third higher training is that of wisdom. The third training is that of wisdom. The second training is that of concentration. But for one to be able to 
achieve actual single points of concentration it comes about in dependence on the prior training in ethical restraint. Ethical restraint is therefore the foundation upon which the other two trainings are cultivated. Dependence on one's mind that is restrained from coming under the, the, the influence of the afflictions, which is the meaning of, of ethics, one can develop the second training of concentration and the, there, thereafter the third training of wisdom. Oh,ndere <laughs> The term used in our text is the three trainings, and the three trainings are those of ethical restraint, concentration, and wisdom. There's another term you would have come across often, the three higher trainings. And the three higher trainings are the same three, ethical restraint, concentration, and wisdom. But what marks them out as being higher is that they have as the, their, their, motiv their motivation the determination to achieve liberation. So such a practitioner will be cultivating ethics in order to achieve liberation, cultivating concentration in order to achieve liberation and so forth. So a higher training is distinguished from a training due to the presence of the determination to achieve freedom. <laughs> The higher training in, in ethics then refers to the determination, the commitment not to harm others, not to harm others through our physical behavior, through our verbal communication, or even our way of thinking. This is the foundation of all training. It's a commitment not to harm. Whether through physical activity, our way of speaking, or even the mind, particularly because the mind needs to be subdued in order to subdue well physical behavior and verbal communication. <laughs> Karachi <laughs> I mentioned earlier when first mentioning the three different trainings that for concentration to come about well, it comes about in dependence on the foundation of the training in ethics. So why is that? So this is something that we need to, to look at. Jamba 
Jambi Gelamsa or that Chen Jimarez and Jambi Zungurua. Then I seen Ning Zun Shiling, Kishi, Zun Chagdi, Mid Sempe, Shizing and some Tanjid, Shizing or Zundu, or the Zun Shen Jimarez and Big Jambi Gizzi. Chesam Lu Yugone, Chale, Libby, Sour Jigdi, Mid Sempe, Shizing, some Tan, Jevachia, Tong Yondu, and the Odi, Chen Jimarez and Jambi Chesam, Jambi, Jambi Tianje. Nessimitone, Explain why ethics is the foundation for all spiritual attainments, but in the context of concentration. So we have the ethics of restraining our physical behavior from engaging in non-virtue, our verbal communication from engaging in non-virtue, and restraining our mind. What it comes down to is restraining our mind from coming under the influence of the afflictions. But let's start with looking at the uh, four illustrations of uh, verbal harmful behavior. So this is the commitment not to lie, not to engage in harsh speech, not to engage in divisive speech, or to engaging in senseless or pointless speech. Having made this com commitment not to engage in harmful speech, how does one keep this commitment? Primarily through using mindfulness. So mindfulness has two functions. The first function is that of being aware of the mental process. And the second function is, so in that, there it's more likened to, in English we use being aware, or you could say awareness, but let's say being aware. The second function of mindfulness is that of recollect, recollection or memory. Recalling that so we're in a particular situation and we are aware that here the wish to perhaps, for example, speak harshly arises. Mindfulness is aware of this wish to speak harshly. Mindfulness, mindfulness's second function of recollection recalls the commitment we made and why we made it. I don't want to create any harm. Therefore, harsh speech or lying must be abandoned. Moreover, I'm trying to create the foundation to develop single points of concentration this will be an obstacle. So in this way, one utilizes mindfulness so as to ensure one doesn't engage in inappropriate behavior. So that illustration would, would apply to the other forms of uh, a ver a harmful verbal communication as well as physical, communi uh, uh, physical interactions. And the third way one restrains oneself is through restraining one's mental process. The thoughts thoughts of covetousness and harmful intent in particular, where one, through mindfulness, notices the thought of desiring something or wishing harm to come to someone. Mindfulness is aware of this. And sec its second function recalls our commitment to restrain our mind ethically and why we are doing so. And this then gives us the courage to fulfill our commitment and not act in a way that we have concluded is inappropriate. So here, in our training in ethics, we are relying on mindfulness 
And vigilant introspection, these illustrations are just look focused on the one, but we're cultivating both of these, and both of them are indispensable for developing concentration. This is such an important meditation, the meditation on ethics. And it comes down to cultivating the determination repeatedly, repeatedly, uh, repeatedly over a sustained period. I will not harm others through my behavior, through my speech, or my way of thinking. And it's not just a mere repetition of that sentence, but it's ut utilizing reasons, taking experiences from our, our life, seeing the outcomes, uh, uh, that what follows from harmful behavior, and being determined not to act in this way again, and role-playing how one can do so, how one can be, respond differently in the future. And this is aided by the prior understanding of the faults of the afflictions. Harmful speech, harmful physical behavior follows from the mind. Therefore, ethics is down to restraining, comes down in brief to restraining the mind from coming under the influence of the afflictions. So it's reflecting in this way again and again that is meditating on ethics. <laughs> ジュンシエダツシエデチキメゲゴマンゴゴマレティネザナディサムタンワスケミドアディマジェバチレアネディネギチキメサムネデデカレハレロワサムタンゴミドサムサユングロワゲゴマンゴゴマレチェザンガ
another uh, clear one, is, is killing. Through having come to recognize that killing is inappropriate, one does not do so. So therefore one has accumulated causes. But causes, causes are impermanent, which means they change momentarily, which means they are finite, they become exhausted. Therefore, even where we have a strong propensity to not engage in something, that propensity still needs to be developed. And it's developed through actively reminding ourselves of why we, we should continue not to engage in a particular form of behavior. This then adds to the strength of our previously accumulated causes. And moreover, amongst non-virtuous behavior that we do not en engage in, some of it will be because the situation readily does not pre present itself. And therefore, we do not engage in this way of behavior. For example, one may not really um, have opportunity to steal. Therefore, the thought to steal doesn't come to mind. But nevertheless, cultivate the causes because circumstances change. And that will certainly change in future lives. They may well change in this life. For example, if um, one doesn't drink, one has no interest in drinking alcohol, it doesn't appeal to one at all, but one finds oneself at perhaps a family gathering or a gathering of old friends, and there a lot of peer pressure is being placed on one, oh, just join us, just have one glass, and then one does. And so here we see how through a change of circumstances or through the influence of others, we can end up doing something that we would otherwise not consider behavior that we engage in. So that's quite an innocuous, innocuous illustration, but it certainly could happen in, in more extreme situations too. Uh, ทาดามีกบาทบิกิกิยาติชะกอเรสิสันดิเนซาลุงเอซิญิจุติมปิซุติมซุยาดิอันเนอาจุกิกิยาวะชิมาทาดามีกบาทบิกิกิยาติชะ
to always include it in your daily meditation and also to ensure that it's included with, within the um, envelope of an over, uh, overriding um, um, uh, motivation. So the context here is the determination for liberation because with uh, following having generated a determination to achieve liberation when one then meditates on ethics, one is of a course through developing the determination that one won't harm, one is accumulating virtue. But because this virtue is being accumulated conjoined with the motivation to achieve liberation, that virtue then is a cause for the attainment of liberation. And in order to eventually attain liberation, one needs good rebirths, such as we've achieved in this life. So therefore, um, indirectly, that this, the causes accumulated, causes of virtue in this one meditation also lead to results of good rebirths. And moreover, it will lead to better circumstances in this life. So the motivation is for liberation from samsara. And that is the result of this virtue. But indirectly, it also results in good rebirths and better circumstances in this life. And how does it lead cultivating an ethical outlook? How does it lead to good circumstances in this life is, if we think of the problems we and others experience, most come from, or much comes from, unethical behavior, in particular that of, of, of speech, lying to others, deceiving others, taking advantage of others, using others. This leads to problem after problem, as well as unethical behavior, sexual misconduct, stealing. So not only does one stop engaging in this and thereby stop creating the causes for suffering, but one's way of thinking is what's being changed, because it isn't a mere refusal to engage in something unethical. We are focusing on changing the mind. So therefore, it's not just that one is not lying, one is focusing on being more honest, more trustworthy, more reliable. These good qualities all come through this training in ethics because one is transforming one's way of thinking. So therefore, one experiences greater happiness in this life due to having better relationships with others, being seen as an honest person, a trustworthy person, a reliable person, and so forth. And one is creating causes for good rebirths and liberation itself. And if one has the goal for higher spiritual, spiritual developments, such as single points of concentration, developing the wisdom, realizing emptiness, ethics is an indispensable foundation for all spiritual goals because it subdues the mind. One's mind becomes trained in mindfulness and introspection and thereby trained in not coming under the influence of the afflictions. And that is our ethics, is this indispensable foundation we all need to train in repeatedly. Sandashabanet <laughs> Sanjogo, <laughs> 
ทรัพย์ศาสตร์ทุกข์ดัวสิเจริญลุงมายิ่งสมบูรณ์เนี่ยลุงยิ่งเสียใจเอาอีกนิดหนึ่งมีอาสัมผัสเชื่อตาตาย
definite benefit. But to transform <coughs> one's mind, one needs to do the same meditation again and again and again. Remembering the synonym for meditation is habituation or familiar, familiarization. We're trying to familiarize our way, um, a way of thinking to virtue. And to also aid our transformation, we need to rely between meditation sessions, so in other words, in our daily life, on mindfulness and introspection. During our daily life, we need to keep what we meditated on perhaps that morning or the previous evening fresh in our mind. And we do so through using mindfulness and introspection. And whatever the topic is, but we're looking at ethics, if the topic is ethics, ensure that one's mind is not coming under the sway of the afflictions. This is the, the heart, the essence of the meaning of ethics. And in this way, through using mindfulness and introspection in our daily life, ensuring that our mind is not coming under the sway of the afflictions, we are strengthening our familiarization, our habituation to ethics. And very quickly, a way of thinking will be transformed. A way of interacting with others will be transformed. And for this to come about, there's nothing you need to buy. There's no need for, for any special um, clothing or gear. There's no need for any expenses at all. You're working with the mind. Buddha's practice is working with the mind. And this is something we need to do continuously. And thank you very much, and we'll conclude here for tonight. Thank you.